I am delighted today to have Dr. Uh, Pierre Corey on the line with us on Skype. Um, D Dr. Corey, thank you so much, so much for joining us. Um, now, just as in it, most people or many people will, will, will know you, of course, but m many won't. So, you no, know, who who are you basically, and and, and what, what's your what's your credibility in this field? That's fair enough. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, uh, John. I really appreciate it. I've, I really enjoy your program, so it's actually quite an honor for me to to come on. But you know, I am a um, I'm a pulmonary and critical care specialist. So I have a board certification, actually three board certifications: internal medicine. Uh, pulmonary diseases and critical care medicine. Um, I'm probably most known as an educator, so um, I, I really enjoy teaching, and it's largely what I've done my whole career. I've been in teaching hospitals. I was a what's called a fellowship program director, so I used to run a program uh, that taught uh, doctors how to be pulmonary and critical care specialists, and I've won. I'm most proud of the awards I've won for my teaching, and so i um, I'm what's called a clinician educator, and I've also done a fair amount of research. Um, and then the last thing that I'm kind of famous for is uh, I was one of the pioneers in what's called point of care ultrasound. And so um, I've helped teach and bring that to the bedside in the care of critically ill patients. And uh, I'm the senior editor of a textbook, which is extremely popular. It's one of the top textbooks in the world, um, and it's translated into seven languages. So that's kind of like wow. my achievement. And then came COVID. So then <laughs> my yeah. credibility to COVID is, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Professor Paul Marek. He's my mentor, my friend, my colleague, and he and I talk medicine constantly. And so he was asked to form a group, you know, a year ago and to come up with protocols to treat this disease. And so we got together a year ago and, and we formed a group and with support from some others, we had a website and we've just trying to been building the most effective treatment protocols for COVID. And so we're a group of critical care intensivists and all we do is read. Probably don't read as many papers as you because uh, <laughs> I don't sure have as do. much time as I'd like, but we read papers constantly. And so I, I would consider ourselves uh, clinical COVID experts at this point. So you've been absolutely drenched, immersed totally in medicine for a couple of decades now. That is, it's what yeah. you eat, think, breathe. It's, it's what you are through and through. So, 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 Pierre, I know you were one of the early proponents of thinking about treatments for COVID-19. And you were one of the first pe people in the world, I think it was, to suggest using steroids. Now, now, what are steroids and why are they important in COVID? Yeah, so so corticosteroids, I mean, they really uh, they, they really are anti-inflammatory. So they, they suppress the effects of both uh, the innate and adaptive uh, immune systems. And those are severely triggered in COVID-19, especially when you get to the ICU. So for those of us in the ICU, we knew that these patients were dying of inflammation. Um, the other thing, which is ridiculously overlooked, is that live virus is generally not present after about six or seven days. It's very rare to have live virus. So these fears of using steroids, because the big fear is that if you give steroids too early, it promotes the replication of the virus. And we agree that there's a phase to it, a timing. Mm -hmm. You want to use steroids later. And just like the recovery trial that eventually showed, it's really in those on oxygen. But what, what the interesting thing about the steroid story is that was the first time I testified in the Senate. So I kind of got lucky because the senator of my state, he one of his pet issues is that he feels that there's been a colossal failure, not only in our country, but globally, in neglect of early treatment options. Yeah. And I guess him and his staff, when they were looking around, they found our protocol. They found the FLCCC. And when he noticed that I was at the University of Wisconsin, he called me one day and he said, hey, would you testify in the Senate about your approaches to treatment? And I was like, sure, Senator, I'd be happy to do that. And so I testified back in May at a time when every national and international health agency had statements we recommend against use avoid use avoid use and so after i gave of steroids they're recommended steroids. against steroids yeah oh all were against steroids mm, all mm -hmm. over the world and when i testified that it was critical for the use of steroids i was roundly attacked and criticized for for uh irresponsible recommendations even though they were based on my expertise and then let me answer your question so why did we know it worked First thing is that Dr. Maduri, my partner, he's like the world expert in corticosteroids and lung disease. He did a very careful analysis of all of the studies from SARS and MERS and H1N1. 
And in all of the other health agency reviews, they concluded that in those prior pandemics, when you got corticosteroids, you died more frequently. And that's certainly true. They were all observational trials. Those who got steroids did die more frequently. So they concluded steroids are bad. As you know, the more sick patients are, the more likely they are to get steroids. So and when you actually carefully looked at that data, which Maduri and a group of other pretty well-known intensivists did, they published this back in April. And they showed actually in the best controlled studies from that era, large studies, there was a massive mortality benefit to steroids in SARS and MERS and H1N1. And so we knew from prior pandemics that it was effective, but all of the other uh, uh, health agencies did not conclude that on their review. The second thing we knew is we just knew it from expertise. We saw so much inflammation in these patients. We knew that it was clinically uh, reasonable. We also knew that virus wasn't present in the late stages. The other thing is that there was plenty, and this is gonna sound crazy, John, but there were plenty of doctors who were getting inundated in New York, Seattle, Detroit, and they found that when they started using steroids, everything changed. People were going away from ventilators, not on ventilators. I still remember one night, a fellow of mine called me and he was working at a hospital in Detroit. He was almost in tears. And he said, Pierre, I don't know what to do. Everything I'm trying is not working. I try PRV and proning. He's like, everyone's landing on ventilators. No one's coming off. They had just split their first ventilator. You've heard of that, where they had to split yep. ventilator yep. tubes. And so <clears throat> what, what was ventilator just, for two patients? Yeah. And so he was in crisis. And I was like almost screaming at him. I was like, you have to start steroids. You need steroids. Steroids. Don't, don't listen to these people. And I said, tell them to get out of your ICU and start treating these patients. And and interestingly, on follow up, he did do that. He started to see benefits. And he told me a month later that he's a little bit of a hero in his hospital because of what he did yeah. at that time, because yeah. he really changed the, the scope of what was happening. But I knew from my friends in New York. So I'm from New York, originally trained there. I knew every I knew a doctor or a director of every ICU in New York City. I was on the phone with them every day. They were getting crushed. Everyone's landing on ventilators. No one's coming off. They were expanding out ICUs everywhere. One system went from 95 ICU beds in their system of seven or eight hospitals to 250 ICU beds in a two-week period. Gastroenterologists, dermatologists were managing ventilators. And, and in a couple other hospitals, they started steroids and they said everything changed. So I knew from the ground, just talking, call, you know, picking up. The, you've heard of the telephone, John? So Absolutely, the telephone yeah. still <laughs> yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually a good source of data. And so, um, so I knew from the ground. We knew from our experience. We knew from prior pandemics. And then the fourth thing is um, – I recognize that this disease actually is what's called an organizing pneumonia. Um, your your listeners may or may not know what that is. It used to be called BOOP or COP. Uh, that's what's called now cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It's a pretty rare disease in that it's not very well recognized, even by lung specialists. But I noticed that the COVID patients reminded me so much of my organizing pneumonia patients. And when I talked to one of my colleagues, who's one of the top chest radiologists in the world, I called him up one day and I said, Jeff, what would you say if I told you that I think everybody with COVID has organizing pneumonia? And he said, of course they do. We published that back in March. This was like in April. And I said, what do you mean? And he, him and a group of other national experts, they reviewed all the CT scans from Wuhan. And in their position paper in the journal Radiology, the top journal of radiology in the world, they wrote the predominant form of lung injury on the CAT scans is that of an organizing pneumonia. Hmm. Just see, so you know, John, the gold standard therapy for organizing pneumonia, corticosteroids. Yeah. And so but, I knew it was an organizing. So those are all the reasons why we knew. And, and but. Yeah. I, I tried to publish my paper. So I wrote a paper saying uh, that basically why is there a widespread misdiagnosis of this disease? No one is considering that this is organized pneumonia. It got published uh, after six rejections. One of the rejections from a top pulmonary journal, the reviewer told me that to prove my hypothesis, I would need to do a randomized controlled trial of corticosteroids. So this was before the recovery trial. And so 
those are my answers to why we knew corticosteroids worked is that it was a, it's a pandemic of organizing pneumonia. That's that's really helpful. And and this is to do with the idea that COVID is a phased disease. And again, you were one of the first people to identify that. Yeah. Um, wh what is a phased disease and why is that so important to know about? Yeah. And so although we wrote about it, Paul really tried to, I think, codify it the best very early on. But I will tell you that at the clinician level in New York, everybody started to talk, to talk about watch out for the pulmonary phase because most people it's mild. It's a viral syndrome. Yeah. We call that a viral replicative phase. Yeah. But then there's this minority that advance into the, like this organized pneumonia. And, and they people knew on the ground that it starts to hit around day five to seven. And so one of my uh, former mentors, he got COVID very early on before N95s were used widely in the hospital. And we were really worried about him. So we're watching the day. Like, everyone was really scared. It's almost like watching the clock. Like, every calendar day, like, am I going to have trouble breathing? And he started to develop a little problems breathing. But luckily, he didn't advance to a severe phase. And so you, we knew that you some went into the pulmonary phase a little bit later on. Um, and then if, if not arrested, you went into, like, late phase pulmonary, which is basically kind of an ARDS pattern, like, yeah. really damaged lung. And so, so that, that's an adult respiratory distress syndrome yep. where the alveoli basically fill up with fluid. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what about anticoagulants? You again, you were a very early proponent of uh, anticoagulation. Yeah. So before, can I, went, I want to mention one other really important mm, please do. Uh, uh, part of corticosteroids is, is I have mm. to tell you. So when recovery trial from Oxford, right? Uh, when they uh, came out with the study showing they tried to save the world, right? Showing, hey, corticosteroids are life saving. You know, I got texts from all over, hey, we should have listened to Pierre, you know, a lot of my friends and colleagues, because they knew I was a very vocal proponent. But here's the deal John, I got to tell you, the dose that they used in the recovery trial is an absolute farce. Six it is milligrams. a joke. Six milligrams of dexamethasone is about 32 milligrams of prednisone. I will give 80 year olds with a COPD exacerbation 40 milligrams of prednisone. And to, to give patients in severe lung disease on ventilators six milligrams is a joke. What we know from organizing pneumonia studies, and there's no great studies, it's mostly case reports and experience over decades, but fulminant cases need pulse dose steroids. So if you look at our protocol, we've been calling for high doses and pulse doses from the beginning because we know all that's the turnaround. Yet the entire world, John, is being treated with remdesivir and six milligrams of death. It, it gives me chest pain to see that a year into this and the entire world has this idiotic protocol, which is ineffective in most. I, I call uh, six milligrams of de dexamethasone, it helps the few, but fails the many. <clears throat> the second thing about corticosteroids and organized pneumonia is that you do not prescribe corticosteroids for a defined time. There's no five days or 10 days. We're not yeah. built with calendars. Yeah. You know, yeah. you follow the disease. That's number yeah. two. You need to do prolonged durations. Yeah. And then number three, organizing pneumonia relapses. And you want to know how disheartening it is when I, I admitted patients back in December who were discharged off oxygen. And they came back five to six days later. The lungs are whited out again. And some of them died. And it was because of widespread failure to realize that you need to treat for long durations with slow tapers. And so I've been trying to communicate that. And and last thing is, I, you know, so many of my trainees are now finding my paper because they're recognized. They're seeing a lot of organizing pneumonia after people are discharged. The pulmonologists are. And so when they search for any evidence of it, they find my paper, which basically is from April saying, hey, world, <laughs> this is organizing pneumonia. So I wanted to talk about that. But you, you asked about the, the anticoagulation. You know, the first four patients we had, we were doing something called a TEG. Do you know what a TEG is? No. It's called thromboelastography. So it's 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 one of the newer and fancier uh, coagulation uh, assays that you can do, right? In, in the past, it was PT, PTT, and INR. Yeah. That's all we had, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. But now yet we have, uh, in a lot of hospitals, something called a TEG, and you can get it very quickly, and it gives you this wealth of information. It tells you, like, where in the coagulation cascade you have a deficit. Is it platelets? Is it clotting yes. factors? And yeah. you can also diagnose hypercoagulable states. And we were doing, because uh, we had heard that there was a lot of clotting coming out of China and even New York. 
So we started doing these tags, and they were all what's called hypercoagulable with zero what's called fibrinolysis, right? So fibrinolysis is normally active in the body, zero. So once the clots were forming, they were not break, breaking, breaking down. Yeah. So we knew we had to use anticoagulation. We saw clots, and we saw these terrible, uh, terribly um, hypercoagulable, and we were actually working with one of the top hematologists. He's very well published. And he said, this is extremely high risk for clotting. And so we were doing tags and we started to do this. And we put together a protocol and the anticoagulation committee at the university did. But we had a chair of medicine who decided to overrule the anticoagulation. There's crazy stuff going on in hospitals. Yeah. Um, there's like leaders telling us what to do where they never did before. Like COVID's made everyone crazy. But this chair of medicine said, no, I do not want to hear of an anticoagulation protocol. I disagree. You need to wait for the trials. And yet what now this is the international show? standard treatment. Yeah, yeah. And what did the trials show? What mm. we knew after four patients. So it, it's really hard to watch what's going on with it. It's just not really good. It's this massive widespread, like, we must wait for trials. People mm -hmm. are forgetting how to doctor. And mm. I'm, I'm yelling all the time, would you just doctor? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we do this for day after day, years. And you, you, you get, you, 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 you know get what a, to do. You get you a feel for it. Yeah. control trial to tell you to wipe your nose after you sneeze. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. What about remdesivir? Is that has a, any an effective antiviral properties? So here's the here's the you talk, you asked about the phases. To yeah. Use an antiviral at three thousand dollars a dose. Yep. In the yeah. hospital. Yeah, it's it's, yep. it's a joke when you start. I mean, <clears throat> it's not supposed to work in the hospital. You know, solidarity showed that. <clears throat> yeah, and it's a very funny money kind of trial. The the one here in the U.S. where they used it to to approve it, it's a trial that doesn't make sense. The longer you give it, it didn't show benefits. But if you gave it for shorter, it did. It, I mean, nothing made sense. And the and the outcomes that it showed are, are weak. They're yes, weak. They are. It's like a little bit shorter until you get out. And so uh, we and don't use it. We've never recommended it. And I think, I, you know, there's plenty of trials showing it doesn't work beyond the solidarity. Trial. There's Chinese trials showing yeah. it doesn't work. <clears throat> yeah. Listen, if you were going to use it, you should use it as an outpatient. Um, if it were to have any effect, you use it day one. But they don't, you know, we don't have equipment. We're not equipped for that. I think what you're but saying I, is I that there's, 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 there's no point giving an antiviral when the immune system has cleared the virus. Yes. Yeah. And there's no more virus going on. I mean, it's it's That's right. it's it's shocking. And and it and you know what I see is is because the doctors don't know what to do and they're all afraid and they're all stuck with these protocols. Yeah. When the patients are still sick after five days, what do they yeah. do? They do another one for another three thousand dollars. It's 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 really disheartening. Three thousand dollars is a lot of money to me. I guess it is to you as well. Um, it's is a lot of money to be spending for something that uh, has got very questionable efficacy. So, so, so the, the phasing is affecting the decision making. Now, um, uh, what were you doing on the eight uh, of December at two thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time? I believe it was a Tuesday. 